Uh, good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is Smart's last program of the year, which is the conversation between Deepika Arvind and Maya Krishna Rao on the what, how, and why of their work as artists. Um, on behalf of SMART, we'd like to thank our partners, the India Foundation for the Arts. And um, this program has been funded by the International Relief Fund uh, of the German Federal Foreign Office and the Goethe Institute and other partners. And we'd like to thank them for their support. Uh, in the round uh, was conceived of as a series of conversations on creativity and culture and context. And we felt that among conversations that tend to be curated and programmed around specific themes, we were really interested in just spending some time listening to artists uh, speak freely about their, about their work. And before I introduce the two artists that are speaking today, uh, I just wanted to um, lay out some ground rules and protocol to be followed. Um, if you have any questions during, during this conversation uh, that, that come out of the things that Deepika and Maya are talking about, then I request you to please share them in the Q&A box, uh, which you will see below, and not in the comments. And we will pick them up at the end of the chat if we have the time. Because this is a, a freewheeling conversation, we'd like to see it go where it wanders to. And if some of the questions seem particularly relevant to that journey that Maya and Deepika are taking, we will definitely share them with them at the end of the talk. Um, in case you're watching and listening on Facebook, please share your questions uh, in the comments thread there. And somebody watching on Facebook will, um, will telegram them to us. Um, to introduce uh, the two artists uh, today that are speaking, uh, that are part of this conversation. Uh, Maya Krishna Rao is a theater artist and teacher. Her shows range from dance theater to cross media collaborations to comedy. Um, some of her uh, celebrated performances include Koldo, Ravanama, Walk, which was created in response to the tragic incident of gang rape and death of Jyoti Singh in 2012. Uh, her latest piece is Loose Woman. Uh, Maya has taught for several years at the National School of Drama and till recently she was a professor at Shipnadar University where she's been instrumental in designing a postgraduate diploma program called TEST, um, which is the first of its kind. Uh, she continues to conduct workshops in the use of arts as a teaching learning methodology. Deepika Arvind is a theater maker playwright, poet, and performer. She's based in Bangalore in India. Uh, she works as the artistic director of the Lost Post Initiative, a theater and performing arts collective that works with diverse artists, largely around the issues of gender and women on stage. Her work has been presented in many parts of the country and across the world. And her plays include No Rest in the Kingdom, A Brief History of Your Hair, and I Am Not Here, an eight part guide to censoring women's writing. In uh, 2021, she will be artist in resident at Pact Zolverein in Germany, and her latest play, Phantasmagoria, uh, will be translated into German and will feature at a global festival in Munich. And her most recent work is PRA 2020G, which premiered in this past week at the Serendipity Virtual Arts Festival. As much as Deepika and Maya are artists that come from very different spaces, who began their careers in different times and different moments, I'm also extremely drawn to some of the similarities that they share. They both perform and direct their own work. They also write it, though Deepika's more a writer and Maya writes in a different way. Uh, the, often their work is solo. They both merge storytelling and character in a way that really holds the politics of their work and the investigation is always within the story of their shows. And finally, both of them use comedy in an extremely full way, even even when it is to take us into the depths of the human condition. Um, earlier this year, I was at Deepika's show at the end of, uh, at the Bharat Rang Mahotsav, and I saw uh, Maya walk up to her and they had a bit of a conversation and maybe that's the, where the seed or the germ of today's conversation began. Because of course, after a performance is never the right time to just have a long winding and sometimes aimless conversation about about your work and uh, and to exchange ideas about how people feel about each other's work and and to ask questions to each other and that's that's really what we want Maya and Deepika 
to feel the freedom to do today, which is just have a conversation, what would ordinarily possibly have been a private conversation, but to do it in a public space. And so without taking up uh, any further time, I'd like to invite Maya Krishna Rao and Deepika Arvind, and thank you so much for joining us and being here this evening and over to you. And as timekeeper, I may pop up now and then uh, on, on your request, but uh, otherwise the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, hello Deepika. Hi Hi, Thank you, Neil. <laughs> okay, so they want this to be like a private conversation and they don't want us to follow any, any format that we know hitherto. So why don't we just shock them and start improvising Deepika? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna shoot my first question to you. Yeah. I'm the last one who saw you perform. Okay. And uh, it's it's so heartening to see a full full blooded performer being there in alba albite in front of the camera of the laptop. Yeah. Um, so, if I may ask, what was in this last uh, performance that you Pyare Pyare Ji? When you when you look at it, is there something that you can pick up in it that will take you all the way back to your own beginnings? that is identifiably there in this last uh, show that you made? Mm, thank you. Actually, that's a great question. <laughs> I never thought about it. So there's the improvisational bit. Um, I think for me, in this show, Pyare 2020G, I talk a lot about being an artist. And I think being an artist in itself is a, and a woman artist is a preoccupation that I've had and often shows itself up in my work constantly, not as a play within a play, not like write theater about theater, not in that way, but truly um, the beingness of the artist, because I think it's a very unique life and a very unique vantage point as it is for many people in the world i don't mean that it's novel i just mean it's unique and i feel like that is a threat that seems to make its way into the work even even in a dance theater production where i'm not the the art uh, the performer and i'm directing others the actor is always present you know um beb beb bodied i would say like in very training clothes like we would wear to rehearsal, sweating, sinewy. Uh, I'm very interested in that. I find that that I'm able to inhabit other people or pe people that uh, actors that I work with are able to inhabit other people in that form. And I'm interested in the in between. I'm interested in the liminal space between the actor and the character or whatever that is. Um, so yeah, that's something that is perhaps present in this show a little bit as you may have seen. But that also brings me to a question to you. Because we both have, we both have played many characters in our solo work. Um, you know, in all of your performances, you are sometimes several people, sometimes you're one person going on this wild journey. Are you also interested in this particular thing that you, you want people to see the actor or when you get on stage, you are you are a character and we have to suspend, uh, you know, our disbelief and go on that journey with you. I, I wonder about that. Yeah. So, you know, I was in you. You mentioned the word uh, liminal when you were talking just now, and I was immediately trying to think how how would that um, how do I respond to that? How does it sit with me? And um, you know, to be honest, uh, uh, Deepika, I don't think I ever think character. I ever think, oh, I'm entering a character or I'm going to build a character. I'm going to make a character. I think what, when I enter the space of improvisation, I am an element within it. I, I don't even uh, sense myself as a, the a specific thinking, feeling person certainly not of this world. And this probably is to do with where one is coming from. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, it always takes one back to one's beginnings and pro possibly because some part of the beginnings were in, very major part was in Kathagali, where everything about the form has to be away from the ordinary, far away. It has to be the extraordinary. So you're in this wonderful space where, like you said, the sinuousness of it, you come in with, you know it's all of your muscle and all of your uh, nerves and your sweat, but it isn't yours. It's just standing there in limbo in space where meaning is going to start getting created, hopefully. And it is in that first action or the second or the fifth that some glimmerings of of people, of atmosphere, of a world start getting made in your imagination, but the character herself or himself or itself doesn't stand out in any specificity. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that is, that is so interesting. It's actually very profound what you're saying because, and maybe this is a great time to start talking about lineage in a sense, Mm, with your experience in Kathakali and a lot of traditional forms, there is this, I think there is this detachment of the individual artist and a kind of surrendering, surrendering to a, a universality and a, and nature itself, mm. you know, in a sense. And I feel like I've experienced that in fleeting moments when I've gone for a short training in Kodiatam maybe or but very short you know these are lifetimes of work so you just go in there to to see or to learn a stance maybe maximum um, but that is so interesting because I feel like I'm not trained in any form as such or I didn't my beginnings weren't in form and I feel like there's a there's a difference um, I, I, while I can understand what you're saying, I have not experienced it. And I'm very curious about so this. So when you were in Kudiatam class, and I know there it, it pulls everything out of you. It pulls another side out of you, another way of breathing, another way of looking, another way of, it wrenches everything out of you. But when you would come out of a Kudiatam session, obviously you were making some, some uh, uh, however tenuous, but some links with, who you are, where you're from, the performer in you. And so in that sense, what kind of lineage uh, that you had were you pulling on uh, to, because we tend to say, oh, these are great forms, Kudiyatam, Kathakali, but there's something that is already residing in us, which may not be to do with these forms, but it is there. And we, we take hold of it to, um, you know, for instance, I, I, just to uh, take this further, okay, so one side of me is Kathakali, but there is another side because we have multiple strands, yeah, in our, in where we are getting. I didn't come from any theater company, neither did you. We neither. don't have the theater company tradition in India yeah. that we do so many plays and we leave the company and we start making ourselves. That's not our story, usually. Yeah. But for me, there was another, uh, another thing happening in my childhood, college years and post-college, which it's only when in talks like this, when you look back, you realize, ah, that had a very firm foundational thing in my uh, performer life. Yeah. And I think it is to do with uh, both at home and in school, this, uh, this dance tradition that's called the dance drama. Yes. You know, which was from an Uday Shankar uh, strand. So where you are dancing and then you may stop and you may talk and then you may do an action and you may actually cut vegetables and then you will dance again. So it was this multi-form thing. So they were called dance dramas. Yeah. And I was doing them in school because my dance teacher came from an Uday Shankar tradition. My mother was a dancer and she would force us into these what were called ballets. So there was that happening as well. So I know that when I came out of the Kathagali class and went into that, into the dance drama place, yeah. somewhere you're calling upon the energies of Kathagali, you know what I mean. So call upon. Um, weirdly, and this is not, a, this is, I don't know if it's even legitimate, right? But what is legitimate? Everything anyway? is. <laughs> I think I call upon people, like I really observe people. Yeah. And they're not in this like, oh, I'm an actor, I must observe people. It's not one of those things you say at interviews. But I mean, literally, like, I'm very obsessed with hands and walk. So if somebody shows me uh, a picture. Yes, I have that as well. 
if i can actually identify people if i see a photograph of their hands or i say this person's hand is like that person's hand or feet or legs or calves like i'm very obsessed with these things so i suppose i call upon a sense of the world or a sense of the living world if that makes sense i don't know it sounds so abstract and in a sense almost um like nebulous but it is it is that and also i think um physically after many years of training in different things i don't have one thing that i've trained in but in different things from contemporary dance to a little bit coloury here to this that different things i feel like this training of listening to what is present um, is something that i've i've there is a moment in the rehearsal that you know that that's happened like i have understood what is present in the room and what i must do in order to to bring things together or to create meaning uh, what are those particular forces present in the room that i must you mean talk? physically in the room or are you talking metaphorically no 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 in the yeah. physical rehearsal room what right. are the things that are present so there is some text that i always bring with me mm. i always bring some part some text Mm, there's always sound there's always some sort of music mm -hmm. you're listening to something during that time and you feel this this is the mood there is a sense again of a living world there is a mood there is a there is a tone there is a register in which this work will be created and i can maybe try to root it in ex in an example that mm, you were also privy to privy to like this show you saw this at nsd where we met neil and where the beginnings of this conversation started which i am not here i knew that this piece was driven by music in a lot of ways or there was there were these there was this constant there was this constant play with music um but a very particular kind of music it it it, it had to be a bit electronic it had it had glimpses of voices going here and there um there was some classical there was something that was constantly and with that sense when i entered the room i felt i i would bring pieces that resembled this this soundtrack in my mind and then based on okay. this mm, sorry it doesn't happen even when you tell yourself i'm going to sit and write today yeah very much so yeah very much so very, very much so because and it's also very much linked to this city especially when because i grew up in a, in a city like bangalore which before like live music was banned and things like that this was a city that was booming with music live music jazz and rock and metal as you know we would be at you know festivals yeah. and things like that so it also has to do with that with the, with a kind of nostalgia for the city um but i i i noticed that you you sound a little bit in a different way and i i don't know if it's okay for us to already jump into that um because you know whenever i've seen you and i've seen videos of your work and i've seen you in in performance it's almost as if the sound is calling you and you are being taken to it and therefore your body follows there is a sense that this is something that is almost a guest that you know like you are you are you you are leading the way uh, to to show this guest parts of the house or i don't know if that makes sense does that yeah you know um i before this talk i was i was trying to think about because uh, when we had an informal discussion you used this very interesting word i've never used it before in a talk um lineage and yes. so i i i i liked the i liked the gravity of the the word and and it came to me that one of my really strong lineages is music and music in the sense of because we are children of the 60s in the city uh, i have i have this whole 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 what should i say they are my grandfathers and grandmothers and it's a whole family there's pop music there's rock music there's heavy metal and for me um uh, you see talking about this uh, you know not having i didn't have ever in my growing up this distinction between dance and theater and music and storytelling 
for me, the only kind of storytelling that I was really immersed in and that was a part of my life and I breathed it was the storytelling that happened in these pop songs, in, in, in the Beatles. So for, for me, Eleanor Rigby, she, she is still there. I can, I can call upon that image that I made on day one when I got the long playing record and I played her for the first time. Uh, Sta uh, Eleanor Rigby, uh, church where a wedding has been, lives in a dream, a face at the window, um, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar. I adore. I mean, I have that jar, I have that window, I have that. And of course, at that age, this is 63, I'm only, when they came on the scene, 64, maybe I got the LP, 64, 65. I was only 12 years old. I don't, I don't know what all this woman at window and jar and if it's all full of metaphor as well, but it's speaking to a child in its own way, you know? And it's, it's going to layer and layer and layer with other songs and other stories. So for me, um, songs have been stories. Mm. And so when I, uh, in fact, when I made my first piece with, with uh, live music, which was a deep fried jam, I was standing in a room with a man I did not know at all. Somebody had simply said, Maya, give him a ring. I think you're going to get together. You'll get on well together. And for me, a large part of my making, unlike you, uh, Deepika, is about stepping into the unknown. I mustn't set up anything or what I set up, I mustn't know too much about because otherwise I won't be excited. I, won't, I need that, uh, that excitement of the unknown. Mm. What, what is here, will somebody, and I sometimes would tell my collaborators, can you put something there before uh, uh, we begin so that when I see it, whew, you, you know, you're the, eh, what's this? Uh, for that, you know, it's the butterflies in the stomach. Hmm. Uh, so um, he played his first, um, uh, 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 he started oh. coming and later on he laughed and he told me, and you know, I, that was the first time Deepika, because coming from Kathgali, the tendency is to keep the mouth shut and I could improvise, but it was usually the whole body and rarely would this open. But mm. when he started playing the guitar, the mouth opened and spoke nonstop. And luckily I had a camera. I video recorded the whole thing. And 90% of the show came out of the first two improvisations we did. Wow. And he told me later, and this is how I suppose music sits in us, he, as performers, definitely, that the moment you strike a chord that is part of essentially a part of your, I don't know, impressionable years or impre uh, where, when things are happening with you, that chord, if it's struck and it's stretched, it'll then help you go from one image to the next to the, and then it'll resonate with all kinds of things and it'll dredge up all kinds of things. And I have learned simply to trust that, that the story that lies in this music, whatever he's playing, it's usually a he, can I tap it? Can I, uh, will it find me? Will I find it? And then it's my job to build upon it. But there is some sense that there is an, a secret story lying in what's getting played now. And once the live musician came into the room, we would barely speak. I, I gave this as to myself as a kind of, um, it needed to be, needed to have that risky challenge standing on the precipice that I won't say anything to him. And I would say, let's not talk. I don't know you, you don't know me. I'm gonna just turn on the camera and let's go for it. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's with music. But then of course at home, I had this very strict performer mother who um, would make me sit with the Beatles uh, record and say, now you learn that song exactly the way they are singing it, get that accent. So she made it into a goddamn discipline and it became something that I had to do and I couldn't enjoy it. So there were all these tensions as well. That's so interesting. And I feel like you're a true improviser in that sense, because I really, I, I cannot go, I cannot go completely. Do you know what the show is about? Do you know what you're going in to do? Or do you go in with absolutely no idea? Most of the time, unless it's, you know, like uh, Commonwealth Games, they said pick up Commonwealth literature. So I had to go around hunting a story. And then I had the story, but then the story, what do you do with the story? 
And I like to go into rehearsals and I don't know what I'm going to do with that story. This is lying there, you know. But then because it was humor and comedy and the story was so beautifully told, that became the challenge. How do I take this Adichie story and stick to her intention and her language, which is so crisp. Yeah. So crisp. I <laughs> love, uh, for me, this is a big challenge. How can I work with a writer? I haven't ever worked with a writer. Yes, actually, I don't know if you remember this and I didn't want to bring this up before because I thought I should throw in a small surprise. Do you ever remember meeting me when I was like 17 years old in a rehearsal room? Um, I was doing a play with Mallika Prasad and Ram Ganesh called Bust. No, I was not 17, I was 22. Um, and you came into the room and you gave us some, uh, I think they had called you for some advice um, and just to look at a rehearsal, but you you were also you were also very torn because you said, I don't work with a script already. Like I don't go into a rehearsal room with an existing script. And in my mind, because my lineage at that time was English theater in Bangalore, where we would sit in a living room set and talk. And often the men would talk and the women wouldn't. Uh, this was a particular type of theater and everything that I've done later on has been a response to that in the sense, what what I didn't enjoy as much. Um, but I remember you in that rehearsal saying, I've never worked with a script. And I was like, what kind of person doesn't work with a script? I didn't understand it. Then only to know that my my joy and like my you know love for doing what I do actually sits in that very liminal space between something that's there and not there. Not mm. completely a lot unknown but somewhere in this and i love devising that is really what i i enjoy doing the most and um, but i remember that moment and um maybe you don't but <laughs> that was a very no, i do in you fact now that you say it i do in fact just two days ago i was messaging malika and that's when i remembered i'd see i thought i'd only seen you on stage because i saw you when you came to delhi and performed but now that you mention it, I even now can recall that room. It was a nice big room. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't remember the conversation. Yeah, and I just thought, and she told me, you know, she's a uh, she's trained in Kathakali. And for me, these were all very um, far away things, uh, like that Adi Shakti existed with its, you know, the way that they used to train and uh, that they still do. But this place, this magical faraway land where people were learning different types of classical forms to to bring to create language essentially to bring tools into the room that there was you know all these places in the for me all of this happened it was a very slow like awakening but it was only through people because i didn't i don't have a formal theater education right so it was only through people and what <coughs> one off sentences have just stuck in my mind for a very long time oh. I don't enter a room with an existing script that stuck with me for a long time. What does that mean? How does that someone go into a room and make something out of thin air? Is that a possibility? Is that? Okay. That I don't know. I'm sure you've done this and I'm going to say it because the moment I say it, I'm sure you'll say, oh yeah, I know that one. Um, so I'm sure you do yoga. Yeah. You do some kind of, I mean, in your warm up, there must be some element of breathing and concentration and all of that. So, uh, and we are both people who I'm assuming when you make your solo, like when you made um, uh, Kingdom, there was nobody sitting on the outside. Did you make the script first or did you go and improvise first? I just went and improvised. Okay. I, but it took five months. <laughs> so. take it, take it. But. So, but, and you had already told yourself, I must, I must get to this man woman thing and make comedy out of it. Yes. This make is something it. to do with gender. Um, that's all I knew. That was okay. the first, like the first, that tipping point into what I, like the unknown, as you call it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, so you see, um, uh, this business that I'm saying of keeping myself excited and I don't know what's going to happen here. I really need that. If I, if I, if I know too much uh, before I get into, before I've turned on that video camera, then it'll deaden all my creative energies. You know, this is a funny thing. So I mustn't know too much of anything uh, of what I'm going to pick up on. But having said that, 
when you're closing your eyes, you've done all your exercises and you're, you know, you're just closing your, you close your eyes and you're just breathing and you're letting yourself become larger than you are. And you're, you know, you know, that feeling you're only gently opening your eyes and not even quite registering things around the room. And you're actually caking up and filling that uh, air and thickening it. You're thickening it. What I'm also waiting for is what is the first image thought that's going to surface from my subconscious, you know? And let me just grab onto it. And I will. That will have to be the starting point. So for instance, I'm telling you, uh, when I went to meet this guy uh, to make deep fried jam, and he's all set up there, he took up half the room, it was a tiny flat, he took up more than half the room, I had some five feet by five feet space <laughs> left for me to jig around in. I again, I let the music enter. And it so happened that I think the previous night I had, uh, or the more, I can't remember, I had read a recipe. Hmm. And in taking that in breath, the, the recipe just came. Now, there obviously was something exciting about the recipe. Otherwise, I would not have latched onto it. I would have continued breathing and waited for the next exciting one. But you know that that image was so, it was a recipe about a woman who she likes to give the history of things. And she had said, you know, the real juicy, wonderful carrot was to be found in Afghanistan. And it was purple. By the time the carrot came to India, it was orange. And by the time it went to Britain, it was yellow. Now, when I, that recipe just came to my mind, it also so happened, Deepika, that that was the time when the American, uh, the bombs were just falling vertically into Afghanistan. And somewhere, obviously, the two images went and locked together. The purple carrot went and merged with um, the, uh, the newspaper accounts that one was reading. Now, I know I have, I have learned over the years to trust this because from my very first solo, which was Koldo, hmm. which is a Manto story, yeah. I know A, I love history. B, um, if there's a tiny, and I'm sure this is true of many of us, a tiny fragment of a situation or an action or a moment of life, if it's resonating and hitting hard, against a huge big landscape, a background, and it's boomeranging back and forth. That's very exciting for, an, uh, for, a, for a performer or somebody who's going to enter an improvisation because both those presences are very firmly there in the space. So in Koldo, it's that, it's, you know Koldo, yeah? Yes. It's that moment of the dupatta where the father turns around to pick it up and he turns around and the daughter's gone. Yeah. And the big landscape, of course, is, uh, uh, is the everybody hacking to each other to death and, mm -hmm. and a platform just sardined, squeezed with people who don't know where their homes are and are going to cross over to f make and find a new home. That's the big landscape. Yeah. So I'm saying that as you're standing there in the room, you latch on to one tiny image or detail or something and you then in the next breath, let it sort of reside in a bigger landscape, whatever that is. But I want to ask you this, sorry to yes. interrupt you. Yes. Um, as somebody, I haven't made so many works that I'm fully sure of a process yet. Yeah. Like I, I am, but I'm also not in, in yeah. many ways. But how long does it take for you to say that actually I trust this rather abstract um connection of images uh, i think i can channel it only through the physical body like i feel if the physical body is prepared then i can trust it if the physical body is not prepared then i tend not to trust it like only because i think it is still very cerebral it sits in a very conceptual space in my mind and i think it's still something that i'm training myself to understand like what is that optimal state of creation whether it's me or whether I'm directing somebody else, it doesn't matter. Uh, for me, that's just one long <laughs> like continuum. It's a thread um, that we're all holding inside the room. Um, and I wondered about that for you because you've also performed way longer and for, for way, in way too many um, uh, solo shows. Like, 
I'm yeah, curious. but you know, having said that, uh, you know, there have been very, very long gaps. And this is, I think, one thing about my career in theater. It's never been production to production to production. There have been long uh, hiatus where you're teaching or you're doing something else. And when I turn, look back, sometimes I used to curse myself. Are Maya, why didn't you just stick with one thing and drive, drive the drill down into the ground and just hone and hone and hone? But it's only after some experience, and I suppose it takes a bit of maturity and some whatever to tell yourself, ah, oh, that's the person I am. You have to go here and there and everywhere. But the yeah. thing is, I have to say, Deepika, that I'm not telling myself that this is a process I latch on to, that I wait for an image, and that was then. But yeah. then immediately I have to get rid of it because then I'm already afraid of it becoming a habit. A pattern, yeah. A yeah. pattern and mechanical and blah, blah, all the things that we are so wary of. And then that's when, for instance, the camera entered my life, this bringing the camera into the you know, I don't even like to call it rehearsal space. It's the making space. Yeah, it's the happening space. It's the space. It's the space. We, we, we yeah, you know, we obviously we change our language. We we don't say see, we don't say scenes. We don't say acts anymore. We say sequences, or we say what do you say? What do you, what are the words you use? Mm, like when I you were devising piece, yeah, that piece, that sequence, that yeah, sometimes it's right. a scene, sometimes it is a scene, sometimes it isn't. Yeah. So then, you know, for me, it became, uh, I started working with a filmmaker who was very excited at this process of a live camera. And I would say, just set up something, a, a, a surprise. And so he would not make a clip beforehand and, 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 and project it on the wall. He would actually shoot something that's lying in the room and project it. And I would not even look at the projection fully. I would just peripherally let the image kind of uh, uh, let a shadow of it fall on me so that I get excited. You know what I mean? So yeah. the eyes are not lazily looking at the image because then you've lost your performer energy. Yeah. You know, so you play these little games with yourself. Now, having the camera, having entered the room and I'm finding it so exciting, I would then go on little shopping sprees and say randomly whatever comes to my hand and if I just get drawn to it. So you see, I picked this up today. This is from a show uh, uh, made in 2006. I love her. Can you see her? Yes. <laughs> so she is this woman. She's from Tamil Nadu. And she has forever that tasla on her head. She's a construction worker. So I, I find her in the, in the Tamil Nadu um, State Emporium here. And I'm just looking at her. And already as like performer, I'm looking at her. <laughs> and I'm saying, get excited, Maya. Get excited in the, in the Emporium. And then you know how we play games with ourselves and then I buy her all excitedly and wrap her up and bring her home and then she has to become part of the improvisation the next day. And there's also this gentleman here. He, he's also, he, he's got numbers on his, you know, he's a, he's a mystery. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, you let these, um, so randomness, picking up objects from the house randomly and just chucking them into the room. And then go in there. And uh, uh, I can't say I actually I can't say that I fully resonate with that because I really work well with like unknown but within structures. Um, if I'm alone, what I are these structures. What kind of pre-structures do you make? Um, I'll, I can maybe give you two examples. With yeah. I'm not here, there's a boxing ring. Yeah. Are rounds mm, everything exists within that periphery so even composition um, composition exercises are created within the square what are the various ways in which actors and performers can play and one of them is a dancer right so uh, we have so many levels like physical levels in which the show can like composition can happen so i've spent days only in composition what are the oh, so tell me sorry i'm butting in now when yeah. you go into the re when you go into into let's say today's rehearsal today's making mm. uh, will you will you have a compositional ideas that you'll give to both the performers no you're the I, same play yeah i've just taken from some other rehearsal i've worked with a korean director and we were doing a thing in um, 
on a circle like it was the stage was the moon so it was a circle and he's yeah. a fully physical uh, he works with puppetry and i was uh, manning a puppet not very well but i was trying my best to do it and his i used his exercise but then i complicated that exercise because the these performers were different and the premise was different right and now tell us walk talk us through that complication what do you mean by complicating as in uh, now you you don't have you don't have the option of not looking each other in the eye or even in that there's music you'll stop you'll you'll be you'll compose yourself in such a way but now you can never be um looking uh you cannot never be facing each other uh, one of you is always lying down and then after that it starts to become so power and stuff ev- eventually shows up but first is the task the task is very sacred the task is very important the task cannot be um cannot be colored or tarnished with emotion and any of that and meaning we cannot tarnish the task we just have to place so then we complicated with you will only stop on this beat you cannot stop on the you cannot stop on like one bar of the music is over you will you can only stop when the bar is over or you can stop before the bar is over so we complicate that exercise maybe put in two other things so now it's the it's the gaze as well as the music as well as the bar so we try many compositional exercises until we've exhausted it then i feel we do it again <laughs> that's mm. when something happens when you and think, then do you give them something thematically right in the beginning or i mean they knew of course they knew what the show was about we discussed it we you know we are also never working in uh, in a vacuum in mm-hmm. in an artificial and envi- not artificial what do i say you know there's a festival at the end of this you know it's a commission you know you have to do it you know you have, so it, th- those are also factors that are playing into this it's not like we're in a european setup where the money has been given to you ab jab jabhi bhi ab banaoge aap you know it's not like that there is a deadline there is an end game um, it, the festival is thematic blah 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 lots of things are at play but at least for those few days um firstly physical training is like 2 hours so so for a while there was also this question that what are we doing but uh, i think if uh, as a maker if i can hold that space and say we are doing something just trust it um, that was something that i um, i really went with um mm-hmm. but again it is within a structure i know that the square is where it's going to happen uh, i also know that these are rounds that will take place or even the new show that you just watched where i uh, pyari 2020g which happened out of a theater the poems are sort of a peg the different poems written through this years a lockdown and very absurd and and turbulent pandemic year now what connects them where we go with that that's something that i that i play with although i did write this because again time there's also time uh there was a factor of time there was a you know there was a finite amount of time that i had to do this not that any anyone gives you infinite time i'm not mm. saying that but i'm saying that's space sometimes creates wonderful things and also the lack of space does something else so you know i try not to <laughs> i try not to get too involved in in those logistics now and say we have what we have we just we just roll with it yeah uh, you know um yeah no, no sorry no i was go for it what were you no uh, because uh, neil mentioned it and uh, he's done a, you know i i i suddenly reminded this thing about comedy Mm. Uh, and um so you see we who are from south india where are you from originally deepika originally uh, originally <laughs> originally i have been born and brought up in bangalore yeah. but um my uh, folks migrated uh, here 40 years ago huh. uh, i come from a sikh household wow, and wow, wow. so many um yeah many like fragmented histories from undivided india and stuff like so that i hope you are the proud sikh today with the 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 protest yes we yeah. are watching and yeah it's a very um It, that's a whole other story yeah that's like, a whole other story no but what i was going to say was you are for now for this moment anyway you're a good bangalorean and a south indian and we have this tradition of we've got this whole classical dance thing that's got to be made fun of and so you had that diva in in the production in uh, uh what's it called here not here i come what 
I'm not here. <laughs> yeah. And I've done it as well, you know. So I, I've also done a, uh, she's a, you know, she's got her basmam and she's wearing her munda veshti and she is just, I mean, she's just dripping in classical tradition. Uh, so she, she doesn't know the difference between life and art and she does the Navarasa and the Navarasa always ends up being only Bhivatsa because she, that, that, that's who the woman is. You know, so I was, uh, so, so <coughs> when I was watching your production, I was giggling to myself saying that, you know, you, there's no escaping this. Huh? All of us somewhere, if in doubt, what to do, make comedy on, just catch hold of the diva, just, just the classical dancer. <laughs> She's, Although that was not at all, that was not at all. Attention. Yeah, because actually it's the dancer's story. It yeah. is a true story. She, of course. Yeah, she is not the body that uh, Bharatanatyam accepted because she's very athletic, almost androgynous. And she's also the body that contemporary dance rejected because... Yes, yes. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about that character. I was talking about the other character. And that character so, actually again comes from her because she is a Baswan Gudi like yes. a girl who has lived in old Bangalore and has... She was very good. She did that moment very well. It was... And, uh, and it's so strange, even though... Uh, we were talking about this before as well about archetypes and uh, certainly this diva is an archetype, right? Because these are the people that we have grown up seeing and the people that we find funny, absurd, but also extremely problematic because of what, of some of the things that they perpetuate. Um, so where does comedy come from for you? Where is that... Is it that you have to tell yourself, ooh, I've got to get to the, to the flip side of this grave thing? Or what, how does it work for you? Um, again, people and how, yeah. actually how people talk. Hmm. Yes, for me. How people talk. Not, not because words, the, your inflection, your um, Anything that you say is so specific to where you come from. And I noticed that about myself. I noticed that about you. Yeah. Uh, I will go into a more Bangalore kind of thing, if depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, we're talking to a Caucasian audience. We start becoming this pan-Indian, like vanilla situation. <laughs> um, but in Kingdom, I'm sure that that accent and the stance of that boy was your um, springboard into his world and the comedy of it, wasn't it? Yes. Day, day, you know this. Uh, yeah. Actually, my question was the same yeah. for you. So, but this is because this is about Quality Street, which is okay. also the one that I watched live. So much mm. of it I've watched online because of like the distance. Mm, you were playing somebody that, did, do you know this person? Have you physically met? Uh, this woman in the sense uh, what i mean is you're not drawing from it's a story right like it's a text that you're drawing from. Text. and you know deepika that text actually for me i don't consider it uh, my comedy because uh, here here was a challenge with Co quality street everything i had to do self-consciously i'm reading that story and i'm saying it's go up now you have to now take that story into okay, you, yeah. not from the in going out. Achha, then secondly, I thought, what shall I do with the story? I'm not one who interprets things, yeah? And I told myself, okay, so I'm going to set out and interpret this and make her a Punjabi woman from Delhi whose daughter has come back. And of course, it's a universal situation. Your daughter comes from, back from America, holier than thou, and she wants a wedding in, in, in back home, smelly, uh, uh, drain-ridden uh, village that you come from. Yeah. So this is this can be anywhere in India. And yeah. I was all ready to inter to to uh, what's the word called to adapt it, to adapt it. When into my life came this, she was not really a Nigerian. She was Ghanaian. Ghanaian. Yes. Somebody told me Maya. I, I I just rang up a friend and I said, you know, I want a Niger. I want a well, I don't know what I wanted at that point. And I said, I'm doing this Nigerian story and I'm going to adapt it. She said, wait a minute. There is this woman. If you manage to make a Nigerian character, then she will make your costume. 
and something so, told me because the back was uh, the back was that padded thing right to totally. make her... it was all upholstery uh, you know, the dunlop that you get for upholstering your sofas yes i took about 7 8 feet of it and wrapped my body in it then put the costume over so you're sweating to bits but the thing was this ghanen woman i just happened to meet her and i said she said i i lived many years in nigeria and i said can you talk like a nigerian when she started talking i started getting really excited and i have only forever done two accents in i'm well one accent is the malayali accent and the moment i put it on i can actually become characters and i can see another world and what not but when i heard her accent i thought oh my god i have to dump my punjabi and it has to be a nigerian so i would record her i would take my tape record or something i had phone i don't know whatever it was and record her voice and come home and for me all this was very new the stepping into the unknown but that, that is it is so exciting to be able to uh oh. to do that i think that's yeah and then when the moment i put on that accent i told myself even if i didn't have the adichi story i'm sure i could improvise a whole one and the way the this ghanaian woman was talking about it she said you know there is very little if you like lagos is two steps above delhi in terms of the contradictions the glaring contradictions and the humor that lies under it all um uh, lagos is only uh, two steps more than delhi so i thought you know i've got to do it uh, and so that was a great experience this getting and her because we're on that cucumber woman and jogging as well <laughs> how you know what i found interesting about jogging even though i saw a clip your accent in that is not like if it's not like if i heard the video i'd be convinced that this is an american you know it's not like it's not a mimicry artist ka bang on point on but in the body in the in everything in the again in the composition the composite picture that is created the composite experience that create is created i was convinced that this was this is like um um it's like there is an american woman standing you mean american as an nri nri, NRI. yeah yeah america yeah i mean somebody who has been born and brought up there but she is looking at the mirror and i am watching the mirror you know it's like one step you know what i mean because i also know that it's not her but i i don't know i'm very curious about these two characters because in a cucumber woman is delhi kind of like yeah this kind of very um, who sitting at um, the parlor um that kind of person how do you how do you find these people okay so cucumber woman it's again straight uh, this thing about um you know this word that we know in theater and we can't work without this tension for mm. me comedy is about tension i i if i wear a ridiculous costume <coughs> i can begin to get into a comedy head but i need i need the tension of that that something that drags me far away from myself and in the old days it used to be a mini skirt because i don't wear a mini skirt when i step out of my house so for me but i wear it in the house so i had i happened to have an imitation leopard skin uh, mini skirt in the mini as in so why and why did you have this oh, yeah because you know sometimes you just see something and you buy it <laughs> i understand this i'm asking yes, you know this one you don't know why what role it's going to play in your life but you know it's essential it has to go home with you and so i this is in 19 97 i wore that mini skirt and my friend was sitting in front of me who has a sense of humor that's even better than mine and she had actually joked with me and said my you're such you're so full of yourself you only put yourself on stage all the time you're not don't care about and my daughter chimed in and they were both teasing me like hell and so i said okay then you make the show i'll stand out then finally they said no you go and so there was all this <coughs> banter going on so i put on my mini skirt and i went and sat there on a chair with my legs crossed with the mini skirt rising even further <coughs> and the tension of that this cross legs and hmm, takes you to ridiculous thinking and from that day onwards this thing about i must present something 
but my head is full of something else. And that tension became the genesis, became the, 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 the trigger point for comedy. So and I imagine you take ridiculousness very, very seriously. No? Ah, but this is from my mother. That is another lineage. <laughs> totally just took it from her and put it inside my system. I didn't have to work on it. Because from childhood on... I have problems accepting <coughs> this. I don't think I, I'm able to do that. No, 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 no. So in kingdom, my dear... No, no, no. I'm not saying this as a thing like... I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, I, yeah. I know what you mean. You may think that I have, but I am very, I don't think I'm ridiculous. I think I'm, I, in fact, I, I'm like, I need to be taken seriously. Like, you don't, you know, I don't, I tell myself this and then it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Like, you think cucumber woman is not taking herself seriously? No, no, no. What I'm trying to say is, is I think I don't have a pension for the ridiculous. Is what I mean. What I see people know? and I envy. You're teetering on the ridiculous, my dear. I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess. He's, he's very on a precipice. He's he's very high energy. I have to distill it. That's form. <coughs> you know, like I don't have. I have many rig ridiculous clothes, but in real life, I never take them into a rehearsal. Yeah, okay, clothes. You know, making space like you know i don't do that i don't take that flight i take something else it's like yeah, that but you may you see in your next show you may do that you may be start in the rehearsal room you may say oh let me just wear a sikonka kada i'll wear a kada on both wrists i'll wear a kada around both i did by the way for like 20 years because i i don't know i nobody forced me to and i did for a long time and then i said it's not so necessary what the kada the kada yeah. yeah really um Anyway, um, what I kind of wanted to ask you is because um, this is something that, again, relates to your question, uh, your um, description of how you go into the room and how you make things. Um, how has your curiosity changed over the years? Hmm. Um, because being an person who improvises, being a performer who improvises, you necessarily need to be curious. And you need to be curious and fascinated by everything almost that is there inside that making room that you call. I find my curiosity deteriorating often, especially because of the world that we live in, because there is so much input all the time. And if something is not, like I also am drawn sometimes to the finality of it and the slickness of it because these are questions because for me the logistics of theater and the making of theater are not very different sometimes they all find their way into the same space you know what give I mean? me an example give me like a theme that you picked up on and then you said hey why 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 why, why should i um no what i mean is yeah, okay no tell for me example again. if i'm in a room and there is this flower now yeah, yeah. i have to be constantly with this object with this thing, I have to be very fascinated by it. I can do it, but there's for me, it's always that we're working in, we're working cut to cut to cut to cut. That luxury is not there. But I find that you, in our conversations, I know if I were in a room with you, you would be curious. You are very curious about anything that exists inside a making space. And I want to know, has that changed over the years? Has that, has that, has that evolved? Has that, do you find it difficult sometimes? Do you, like, what is that? What is that curiosity? You know, now in that you're asking me the question, Deepika, I think more than curiosity, I've been, the way the trajectory has gone in the last, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years is allowing myself to be pulled. It hasn't been about, oh, I'm curious about this. Let me follow it through and make a production out of it. No, it's been mostly allowing myself to be pulled. And when I say that, a lot of it has been the protest stage. You just yeah. get a call. And of course, you have the option to say, sorry, I won't be able to do it. I put down the phone and that's the end of it. But no, there's this, yeah, ban sakta hai. Huh. I think that's what I mean. I think that's what I mean. I, and I told you this as well. I find yeah. myself debilitated in this situation 
No, no, no. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think you, you, you see, because of watching your body and I'm going by kingdom, uh, you know, we all have this tendency of, um, we come out of rehearsal room and then there's a kind of fragmentation that happens, you know, and then we become some other person and then, uh, but this, you know, this business of uh, walking on the road excitedly, like I'm the performer now, you know, this self-consciously letting crossovers happen, that I'll be the performer in real life and I'll let real time enter the rehearsal space. You know what I mean, Deepika? Like I'll just sit there in the rehearsal room with ordinary energy, not the creative, exciting. Uh, no, I, say I feel debilitated if it is I know, fun. so what I'm saying is, okay, let me, I'll share this with you and maybe it, uh, I do know that when I'm called to on the protest stage, uh, I have already been pained by that event, whether it is rape, whether it is farmer protest, whatever it is. You've gone through the pain and over the pain, there is anger. These two things are, they're, they're, they're full. You're up to here with them. Hmm. And then, so I feel that when, when, I'm, when I'm called to do it, I have to pick them up and put them in another place. And then I go into the space or a lot now, you know, I was going to say to you that me who was never a writer, hmm. I'm beginning to be writer now because there's no time. You have only two days. So in, with that performer kind of energy, you sit at your <coughs> laptop and you know, like I was talking about this dupatta of coal, though, with the landscape of uh, partition. Yeah. So you pick up a tiny, 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 tiny detail from whatever this, um, this protest or this issue is about. Hmm. A tiny detail that moves you. Like in that, you know, the Hathras, the Hathras, in the, the awful rape. I closed my eyes and I just got two or three images. One was the the flames of that of that pyre, that the, the fire that these men lit. And when I saw those little flames, they uh, they were like, I want to be something else, be, be, because that pyre wasn't really a pyre that her parents had lit. Yeah. So the, and I saw then it really is about letting some tiny detail come to you and then working from there. Actually, I wrote a small poem. Well, then uh, there you are. So, so, so then no, you but I mean, what I mean to ask actually, yeah. that yeah. you know, also because I saw your uh, footage from Jamia, I saw uh, what you did. Um, I saw Walk at Rangashankara actually. Yeah, I did see Walk at Rangashankara. It was in that equal festival yeah. you know, three years ago. With a sling. With a sling. Yeah, you were injured. I remember this. Mm, this, not that everybody has to do it. And I'm not saying that. I just feel I find myself extremely debilitated because I feel my, this thing to respond, may, I can only write. I cannot perform. I can only write maybe. I cannot perform. I find that the performer in me is debilitated because I, like I was saying in earlier as well, the performer and the actor are not, uh, I mean, the performer and the person are not very different. The artist and the person, that line is not very different, especially not only in the way, that's an obvious thing to state because I mean, yes, but what I mean is even in my work, that is something that has been, that has carried on. So it, it's all, almost become a form unto itself. You know what I mean? Well, I'm wondering where where was the genesis of Kingdom from? You obviously didn't think to write it and give it to another actor. You wanted to perform it. And if if I were to <clears throat> uh, uh, look at Kingdom and just shift it a bit, it could become a protest piece. Mm. You know, I think we make these divisions in our mind. They don't actually exist. Yeah. <laughs> if pro if kingdom were to become and you know time is of essence on a protest stage yes exactly do one asking, because right. you're able to you're able to like it takes a certain mm, to ah, do now you see i can already see if I, you and i were to sit together with kingdom 
I'm sure there will be a two minute here and a two minute there and a three minute there. And if we were to put them together and give it a little twist, you know, the twist is because we tend to think, I'm not saying you do, but we've moved on a lot. Uh, protest theater is not about raising a fist. Protest theater is about the performer firstly moving herself in a creative way and then taking <coughs> that creativity onto a protest stage where other people have raised their fist. We don't as performers, we don't. And I can see then this your <coughs> Bangalore boy of kingdom becoming a five minute protest piece. It's, it's about the lens and yeah. it's about some tweaking. So tomorrow, if there's a, if there's a, if there's a rally around some, some gender issue, a five minute tukra of kingdom, a little redone, we'll find place in it. Right. Yeah. I, I see what you mean. I suppose. I'm just, I'm just showing up on the screen. I'm so sorry to interrupt this very like invigorating conversation at the moment, just to say that we have about 10 minutes left. So, and I know there are other things that you all wanted to address. No, yeah. but you can also Neil, if there's something you want us to address can also say. No, no, I'm, I'm, I think you're well on track in the way that you, this conversation has organically developed. There are a few questions in the Q and A box, but we'll come to that. Once you feel like you've, you've reached the end of uh, this kind of particular thread that you're following. Uh, so let me know when you like to take questions and we'll, we'll, uh, okay. So you're saying another 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I'm only uh, throwing off responses as they come to me. We obviously in a zoom meeting, we don't have the time to think, hmm. you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. I have never tried this business of music and what I think is comedy, you know, so if there's a guitarist sitting on stage. <laughs> I know it can be funny, like I've done funny things in deep fried jam, but mm. it isn't comedy. So for me, these two things are in two different boxes. And possibly, and having now been on the protest stage uh, quite a few times, that line has blurred. In fact, uh, I have taken things that I made in the, in, on the protest stage and brought it back. And then because I was making Loose Woman those days, it became part of Loose Woman, which is quite clearly a black box or a, or a mm, regular, regular. Yeah. Uh, An inside space, yeah. Yeah, it's not a protest thing. But finding it on the protest stage and then recrafting it and re-improvising it. And so these lines get blurred. Yeah. I think I still, yeah, I, I'm. Tell me, tell me, I mean, out of curiosity, for instance, what is the kind of theme that, I mean, we're calling protest or let's say street. Yeah. yeah. What's the kind of theme that you would, you're saying, oh, I want to go there, uh, but I don't know if I'm ready. What sort of theme comes to mind? Is it, I, it yeah. nothing, nothing. That's what I'm trying to say that for me. But you're feeling the lack of it. Uh, no, I don't feel no. the lack of it, but I do wonder, like, what is that thing? Like, for me, the uh, the reason that this Piade 20 G uh, got, like, was made into a show was, uh, I was just putting up these poems for a lark. Mm, and when I say for a lark, it makes it sound like, but literally for fun, but also because this was the most urgent way to respond. Because I, and in the show note also, I say theater for me is slow, it takes time. Uh, but writing is quick and now you don't even have to publish it anywhere, right? You can put it up on social media and that's, it's a legit, like your writing is in the world kind of a thing. Yeah. And so obviously Anmol who saw that felt like it, there was some like performative potential in that, but I didn't for a second think that it was, but that, that was what I was able to do. Um, but as a performer, if somebody calls me and says, there's a protest, will you come and perform? I can't, I'm too, it's too, uh, it, it, like I said, I don't know if there's a better word. It just, it just debilitates me because A, I feel like, um, I don't know if, you know, my work speaks to this. If, if I'm like, there are many questions that, 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 that come to me and I just see that you're able to do it, do it 
uh, perhaps you have all these questions, but you're able to quickly, like, you don't think about it. You just, you're there. You know, Deepika, the other thing is, <clears throat> it could also be because my beginnings were in street theater. Right. You know, my beginnings in theater were in on the street. So the, that's part of lineage as well. I guess that is, yes. You know, so, I, I, and then I gave it up because I said, I'm if I get, if I do only street theater, I will never grow as a performer. So self-consciously I put it aside and I never went on the street for, I don't know, 25, 30. And I feel, sorry, just to interrupt you. I feel if I don't do this in a way, if I don't like respond as a performer, I feel I, I won't grow as a person. I really feel this. I feel a lack. Uh, actually, I, I think I should say it. Yeah, I do feel a lack of it. I'm not able to do that. It's not that I have to rush at the first moment. Yeah. But there is something, no? There is something. Yeah, yeah. It's That's because it's, you're a socially committed person. You're you're thinking, you're th you are you are aware of the times. You're committed to change. You are that kind of person, and so you want to take the next step. Having done it inside closed doors, you want to go further out. Maybe, and I also wonder: is it? I think we forget that as artists, as you know, we're also people who come from particular particular kinds of upbringings, particular kinds of places where we think we we can be and where we can't. And a lot of that has, a lot of that for me is is solved in theater, like it gets solved, yeah. in, it's yeah. resolved in theater at least. And then keep you keep doing it and you keep resolving it. It's not that it goes away. It just, yeah. the act, the commitment to performance, the act of performance is a resolution for me. Yeah, yeah. Like it can't sure. many things, yeah. but Mm, as a person, I'm still wondering like where I where I sit with these things, and I think that is just something. It's again, it can't be answered, solved. It's not like you read something and a bus ho gaya, ap perform kar lo ye ho gaya. It's not like that. I think it's a constant thing, you know, because we are being called to respond in different ways in the current moment. And you know, something strikes me, Deepika, and this is probably a question that we wanted to ask each other, which was about what challenges you to Yes, do. yes, I was also and going you know, I'm going to link that with what you're talking about, the protest. So you see, I find this a very, some things very exciting about this uh, being a, a performer in lockdown. You, again, the tension of, I am sitting in a space that is personal, some bit of it may be private, but not private really, it's personal. It's my personal history, yeah, is all in this space. And the moment I look at the screen without seeing that public, it's public space, all here in my home. And that tension I find really exciting, really exciting. I, uh, what I've discovered in lockdown is that I can forget about all these notions of time that I had earlier. We usually would make solo performances that were an hour long, yeah? I'm sure you have felt this, that when you have watched, somebody excitedly says, oh, this production, some national theater uh, show being shown, it's boring after a point. These cameras looking at a production that's on stage and you're following these bodies like this, after a point, you lose the link. Mm -hmm. That's because it was meant to be a production that you're meant to experience live. But if you were to think to make a tiny pro, Call it protest, call it what you like, responding to, I don't know, farmer protest or responding to anything in the world out there, but with the comfort of your, not comfort, with the, what is safety of, I'm here. And some friend on the, you're on a Zoom meeting and she's recording or he's recording on that end. And you're just picking up bits and pieces and you are trying to cross that line into the public, into the street but sitting here at home. That is exciting for you? Oh, for me, if you were to ask me, what's your challenge right now? And and also what is something that you look forward to? Because I know that when we talked, you said that this is actually a very exciting time for performers. You, I mean, you're, you, you've you said this. I tend to think the opposite. Um, yeah. No, I also agree with you because I'd rather be live, but there is yeah. something. Yeah. And not just life it's not just life to be honest i feel i lost confidence this year as a performer because yeah, yeah, i think we all did deepika yeah. i mean and there's no point i'm not trying to say that i'm all sort of full of yeah no i know what i mean is that and that was a very big um 
was a big setback because it was like it, the only way that I'm able to do what I do is because I do it a lot. And we are really mostly what what we do most of the time is what we end up being good at, right? Or having some claim over in some way. And I guess that was a sense of uh, there was a loss and whatever. But I know that you you've said that this and I'm I'm so curious because even though you're from the generation that perhaps mm, this world is actually the new world in a way, um, you seem much more optimistic and positive about the possibilities, which I'm so like, I'm actually really thankful for because I want to feel that way and I want to be able to, you know, I want to know why actually. Uh, I'm not, I'm not hopeful. <clears throat> I'm just, I just see it as something completely new because like I said, you know, for me, the unknown was the first step into making theater. It has always been like that for me. So yeah. this is the new unknown. Right. This is the new uncertain. Yeah. And for me right now, I can see six boxes here on okay. my screen and, and, uh, if there were to be, for instance, four boxes, my curiosity is if I, if you were sitting in Bangalore in charge of one of those boxes, somebody else in Kerala, somebody else in Toronto, and we actually conducted a, an improvisation like this. I think it could be, I mean, I even mentioned this to you the other day, yeah? Let's not feel isolated. Let's not think that we have to make ready-made shows and bring them to a Zoom yeah, uh, yeah, let's start. Let's start the the making right here with Zoom. Yeah. Uh, I, I yeah, I, I agree with you. I did actually a training earlier this year, viewpoints okay. and Suzuki training. Uh -huh. Like it for about three weeks, I think. Okay. And in that we were using, you know, the different uh, Zoom boxes as improvisational spaces. Who did you do this with? Say that again, uh, Deepika. With the city company in New York. There yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah, they. I was meant to go study there a couple of years ago, but unfortunately, I couldn't afford to. Um, but when they decided to do this online, I was very excited. And we did Suzuki training, of course, because it's physical training. At least the you can see, so you yeah. know that the form is right, whatever. And they were they're also so con like seasoned. They were able to read energy. They were able to read who's present, who's not present, at least to some extent. But Viewpoints, which is a tool for choreographers that they have used into their work with the Suzuki, which is from Japan, blah, blah, blah. They basically use that. So there were several boxes and we would enter, mm. like we put our videos on, like actors would enter a room. Mm. Like how if, you know, you're standing on the side and then you'll enter, there's music playing and then we start improvising. And we started mm. doing that with the little Zoom boxes. So depth was now we're not reading depth in the way that we used to, which is that we're reading depth in a different way from here to this divan is where I can go. But how do I how do I come close to you? How do I go yeah. far from you? How do it was very interesting. How do I play within levels for this it was very interesting. But I did it because there was somebody like there was a structure and I was able to just kind of go and be like mousily try some <laughs> things, you know. But uh, it takes it takes a while. Except when I did this show, then I then I had to obviously improvise a little bit, right? Because um, the one that you saw on, yeah. on, but to improvise with other performers, I certainly think we should do that because that yeah. will. Because then we go off and we say, "Oh, I got this out of improvising together." Yeah, and no, and it's just the practice journey. of it. The, just the practice of it. Just yeah. the the ability to be able to say we. We were in some sort of space together yeah. and something happened. I don't know what it was, but something happened, you know? And uh, we are, some of us performers, uh, we, uh, we, we, we only can exist by giving and taking and giving and taking. So I, I'm sure we can do it like this. I'm very sure we'll find another way of doing it, another way of making as well. So I'm all for, um, all for trying. I hope this Zoom meeting may become the trigger for future such meetings, Deepika. I can see Neil there. And I'm here because I got so excited, I decided to open my box and uh, make, yes, present, okay. present myself to you, Maya, for improvisation. But um, <laughs> we're almost out of time. I just wanted yeah. to put in one one uh, question in from the box. 
I mean, uh, I must apologize that a few questions have come in and I'm sure we won't be able to address all of them. Some of them have already appeared in some way or the other through the talk, uh, conversations about uh, the political and the absurd, conversations about being the performer and director of your own show. But the one thing that uh, is kind of intriguing to me and also opens us out to the audience is there's a couple of people who've asked about the role of the audience in, in your work and both your work. Uh, in so far as they can also um, interrupt the flow or change it. Um, and I thought that that might be interesting uh, to close as a subject is, is to open it out to the outside and um, how you all view the audience and their role in being able to uh, influence, interrupt and uh, inspire the work. Wanna go Deepika? <clears throat> Okay, um, the audience is for me an ally. Now I've learned to say that. <laughs> but before I didn't know that in these words, uh, I used to think that they're very like, this is always a constant negotiation uh, that we have to make. Uh, there are a lot of artists who say, you know, I don't really care what the audience thinks or those kind of things. But for me, I, I slowly began to realize that I really wanted them to come inside somehow into the space. And then while I can be quite a little bit shy in person in front of an audience, when I'm in character or the performer, whatever that avatar is, um, I really find that they can be an ally so I kind of sometimes I use them I manipulate them I play with them I wink at them like I try to do different things to bring them into the work yeah. and always treading this very fine line as in how open can this interaction be uh, for example how how do we not make it tokenistic or super linear or super you know like how can it be more a, a way to meet somehow um, and so that's also something I want to be able to do which is uh, like in some of my work there uh, in no rest I'm like playing with them I constantly ask them questions I make them certain things and people and I'm not here they're four-sided so they also watch each other which is another way of complicating that relationship but I also um, want to do something where I change the numbers I suppose maybe to fewer people to so that interaction word is always a bit mm, weird because mm, it also it's a it's sometimes very forced and very contrived how can we still invite them into the space if the work asks for that it's something i'm constantly thinking about but they're very very like that part of performance is very very important to me yeah i mean i don't want to repeat everything you said and i i totally agree with and i've experienced that as well but I, I want to just share this here for <clears throat> our uh, viewers as well. And my, my most challenging, learning, enriching um, experience to do with audience was in theater and education. And, and this was in a company mm, in England where we, we worked for three months, I think it was three months, only to create five minutes of theater so that the reins of the theater could go into the hands of high school kids, which was not easy. We were living in a very rough area in Leeds. But you have to, you make that five minutes in a way that they are so driven by curiosity mm. that you hand over the reins and you then become, if you like, the tools in their hands that they can call for characters or they can call for, and you then in a split second so, you know, you're talking about the split second thing, this protest. I think that's where I, uh, somewhere, some of it got honed as well. And I am not a person who's lived in England. You know, I'm a good Indian. So to create British, but this thing about what we call, as you are performing, you're signaling. You know what I mean, Deepika? Yes. You, you are signing. So I've got a scissors in my hands. And I'm saying I've got to open this this letter from my uh, from my husband. But the way I'm holding the scissors can sign so many other things, including the relationship that I have with my husband. Yeah. And, and what is that relationship? All these questions must start emerging in the minds of those young uh, people. 
so that they will take over the reins and they will stop being audience and they will actually become the makers of the rest of the uh, play, if you like. We didn't call it play, we called it a program. Yeah. And that feeling of I am only here to trigger something, oh, it was so exciting. It was so exciting. I tell you, it, it gives me goosebumps. After 40 years, it gives me goosebumps to think of those days. And you know, I must say this, it was only in experiencing that five minutes of pre-rehearsed theater, where after which you don't know what's going to happen, but you better be ready for it. That is what made me a performer. No, I mean, of course, all this training and Kathali and blah, blah, blah. But you know, the words we use about belief, about the truth of the moment, because the truth is not just made by me. The truth is made somewhere between them and me because I have to be able to read whether they are uh, 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 picking up my sign because if they are not, then the rest of the one and a half hours will go to pot because they will say, that's a TK, you've done your five minutes of kahani khatam, bye bye. You know, so that kind of audience who is not going to be sitting and receiving it. And I'm not even going to interact with them. Interaction is like baseline. Participation then is like mid, taking over and from audience becoming maker. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, those, are, those are delightful. Then one came home and worked with in NSD with such uh, programs. And I, I, I used to find that deeply and it's also deeply satisfying because it's all in the area of education. You know, you're not teaching something, but mm. they are learning on their own. The yeah. audience is learning for itself. Anyway, so I just wanted to throw that in. And so there's so many other things. I know audience is also down to how you play. Like I'm sure all performers, we love the thrust stage. Like how Deepika is talking about the ring, the boxing ring, and where the audience can see the other audience through us uh, is wonderfully complex. And you make this audience talk to that audience, maybe not verbally, but maybe, and you become that, uh, that, that kind of, yeah. yeah, that electric tar between them. Oh, I love that. I think we're at 7.30 and we've, um, we've come to the end of this talk. I want to just thank, uh, profusely uh, Deepika and Maya for sharing this time with us and in some senses allowing us to interlope on what has been a really uh, fascinating conversation that has merged your rooms and your experiences and your worlds and um, I'd like to thank everybody who's been here and who's listened in mm -hmm. and uh, also those of you who have sent questions that weren't answered I, I apologize. Um, uh, we wanted to keep this freewheeling and I'm so happy that it went in so many directions. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thanks once again to our partners, the IFA and the Gert Institute and the International Relief Fund for allowing this program to happen. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who's been here. And yes, this recording will, uh, will, go, will be up on Facebook. And we also hope to make it available for public in some form or the other, whether it's a video or a podcast in the future. Uh, in case some of you uh, know other people who'd want to access it. Thank you, Deepika and Maya, again. Thank you very much, and good night to everybody. Uh, thank you, Neil. And thank, thank you, everybody yes. around and behind. And Yeah, thank you for listening. I hope we... That audience that we never saw. <laughs> yeah, I hope it was sensed. <laughs> some way insightful or meaningful to your Sunday evening. <laughs> We shall meet again, Deepika. We shall. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. good night. Good night.